Hello everyone, Adam here again from Vector3D and we're back at TCT Show, no, TCT360. Why do I always get that wrong? And this time we're at Construct3D or Constructed. So, firstly, can you let me know who you are and like personally as well as what Constructed or Construct3D is? So, uh, I'm Jacob Lord and I'm the main designer behind Construct3D's printers. We're a two-man team and by man, I mean uh, mother. <laughs> so it's me and my mom. I'm the really engineering and technical side. My mom is the humanitarian, social. She can get into any conversation to the point where it's kind of scary. So what is it that Constructed actually tries to do? What is the purpose of the business? So the main aim is just produce a good printer. Like I started collecting printers from quite early on and I kept buying them just to get more things that fit the areas that the others didn't do. So I had an engineering printer and I had a building for art printer and I had all this because they all did them differently but never perfect. And by my 12th printer I get I got really bored machines <laughs> and I rebuilt everything from the ground up and I kept doing that and I went, screw it, let's build a new one. And that's really how this started. So developing from lots of separate different DIY solutions into something that you thought you could do a little bit better. Just a little bit. Um, like the, the very first prototype of the Mini uh, was a Ender 5 that had only one part remaining, which was the frame. Every other part was gone. The plastic brackets get rid of. They're now steel. The hot end, nah, slap a um, E3D aero. Got it. An E3D aero in and put a strain gauge in, PEI bed and all that. And that was really the start of how it happened. Um, things kept progressing, kept redesigning, building a new thing, designed a frame from the ground up, designed it so it simplifies how you build it. Because again, I'm a small company. We don't have the luxury of injection molding machines, but we do have the luxury of a lot of good outsourcing companies. And yeah, it's just making it so it's available to be made without a hundred thousand pounds of putting into the company. So when did you start this kind of project? How, how long has it been going? How long have you been developing before today? Now you're releasing your machine. So I started about six years ago when I was 18. I got my first printer then, and that was the downfall. Trust me, that was a downfall. Um, but yeah, we've been full steam ahead for the last two years. That's when we incorporated because uh, COVID hit. And that was awful for us because I was doing a master's on software engineering. And you'd think software engineering is the one thing you can put onto online. No, <laughs> just no. It's so hard just because the amount of work you have to do, it's so much easier over the shoulder. So I quit my master's, went to an undergrad, finished that, and I needed a job. And I had my printers. And during that time, I was press ganged by my mom into the National 3D Printing Society. And I was put on as one of the designers for the headband and all of that. So you'll see like halfway through the design radically changed. That's when I came in. And from that, I kept getting questions. Why are my printers taking eight minutes to print a headband while theirs are taking 40? And that's when my mom realized, Jacob, do you want to sell your printers? I'm like, maybe. I never really considered that. It was just me, my room, and a couple of hobby machines. And that's where we really kicked off, was like, actually, this is a product. This is good enough to save five times the time. We could put this in schools because at the moment, the industry is crying out for additive in schools because at the moment, the only way you get education and additive manufacturing is university. And you really need to start that below that. If people don't know it exists as an education path, they're not going to choose it at university. So say a school, you've got 30 kids, you've got a regular printer, it's going to take months to print all of their stuff. You need it faster. So that was one aspect. Um, yeah, it, it was just build a faster, better printer and make it good. So what is this printer we've been talking about? I mean, I can see three machines here. We'll cover them on screen for you. You've got this small one, smallish one in front of us. Let's cover some details. So. First of all, like basics, what are the like headline specifications of this mini machine? Okay, so headline specifications, 320 millimeters per second. That's as fast as the motors can spin before they produce too much EMF and stop spinning. Accelerations, massive point. Doesn't matter if you can go fast, if you can't accelerate to that speed. So 20,000 millimeters per second accelerations 
It's a core XY, so the head is quite light. It's still quite a heavy head, but it's lighter than if you're slinging a bed around, which means you can get those accelerations. Input shaping, by default, every machine will have a custom calibrated input shaper for that very specific resonance of that machine. It's also really good to check if the machine's broken, because if the resonance is different than what it's expecting, something's come loose somewhere, and we can catch that before it happens. That's a very little, a clever little diagnosis step that I think a lot of people might not have noticed, so well done on finding that one. Oh, it's great, because during manufacture, you can test every stage with resonance. If the machine isn't bolted together right, it won't vibrate right, and you can check specific things relate to certain things. If it's a really low resonance, it's the bed. Really high resonance, it's the frame. And you can do that throughout every step without needing a couple hundred thousand pound of computer controlled equipment to make sure it works. So starting to look in a little bit more detail at the components themselves, let's start with the bed. It looks from a distance kind of normal as we'd expect, but something tells me it's not quite. No, so the bed is very special because it's really, it's a departure of what you're used to. So if you look at it and you scrape away the paint, it will look like stainless steel. It is not stainless steel. This is a material designed for deep space satellites. It's in the uh, James Webb Space Telescope because you cannot have heat creep on those parts. So we've used a similar material. I'm not saying the material, so um, yeah, it's a very super special material. It doesn't warp with heat. And the reason being is if you want to get rid of heat warp, there are a couple of solutions. You could put a massive thick cast aluminium bed and machine it flat, but you'll still have internal stress on that. And no matter what you do, you can minimize, but you can't get rid of. So we wanted to attack the source of why that's happening. And that's the material itself. Because no matter what you do, your heater is at the bottom and your printer's at the top. You're gonna have a, a temperature differential and that causes warp. So we've used a material that expands 10 times less than glass. And that makes sure it stays flat throughout whatever you do with it. It can heat up to 120 degrees, which is lovely. A bit too hot on my side, but it's lovely. Um, and it doesn't warp. And that's the main thing, because I hate leveling beds. The motors of the bed are independent. And the reason... Sorry, how many, how many motors have you got? There? It's only two. So we did test three independent motors, but the cost would up the price that you'd have to pay by 150 pounds. And the quality didn't change. So save money, you get a better machine, it's cheaper. That's good for us. So you compensate for that with like a mesh instead of just moving the bed, you can mesh? So we do both. So we've got gantry calibration, so it checks both heights of the bed to make sure it's flat before it does 25 point mesh, uh, mesh leveling. And on top of that, the probe we use is a industrial CNC probe. So instead of using these off the shelf, like 3D printer probes that you could either damage or they lose calibration over time or they're affected by heat, industrial CNC probes don't like that. They, they work fantastically. They're really cheap, which is the best thing. But they're so reliable, there's no moving parts. And because they're designed for CNC's, they don't break. So if you do break one, it's next day delivery, you can find them anywhere. Obviously, we'd, if they're in warranty, we'd repair that. But you're never gonna end up with like a proprietary part that you cannot replace, or you cannot repair, or find an alternative for. So, so sorry, that, that sounds like, that's one of the big reasons maybe why we're seeing a lot of kind of commercial off-the-shelf parts here. There are a few bespoke bits in the joints and the plates, but largely, I'm recognizing quite a lot of these components. Well, we, we have a good, if someone does it better than us, just use their parts. Like, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I'll make it worse. They've got teams of engineers that make better products than we do. It will be a bit stupid not to use their intelligence for our benefit. So, hot ends, E3D. Same with the extruder, E3D. They make some of the best stuff available. The Hamera we've got in this, fantastic it's so fast it's so light especially at these speeds because some of the other extruders they kind of suffer at high speed printing the nozzle and the heat block pure copper zinc plated it means higher thermal mass more consistent melt of the plastic and higher flow so we boast 24 cubic millimeters a second of flow but it can go higher than that because of the copper we've got a titanium heat break in there again made by e3d but you can get alternatives but Made by EDD, it's so high quality that we can't quibble it at all. Same with a lot of the other parts. We've got a duet logic board in here, and 
the reason being, instead of like a closed source, you can't modify it, you can't do what you want with it, the Duet side is fantastic. The community is amazing. And that's one of the big things, because for a maker like me, if I want to do something weird, I want the flexibility to do that. And while we will give you a, a preset machine, you should be able to change that at will. And say it's three years down the line and you dropped out the back of a truck like we've done once, to be able to get spare parts for that, you shouldn't have to like come beggars to see if you've got one in the factory. There should be available things, and that's the main thing we want. Repairability, speed, reliable, and easy to use. Uh, what are the other things that we've not looked at? So one of the things that maybe concerned me a little bit on a high-speed, high-performance machine was the use of V-wheels on the, on the gantry. Would you like to go through maybe a bit about your justification for using those and why you're maybe not so worried about it? You have opened a rabbit hole. So we've done so much testing with V-wheels, the materials used, rails, the materials of them, because they do differ. The, the slight changes change the profile. So the reason we've got this hybrid system of a linear rail on the X, A, it keeps weight down in size and complexity, but it does work better for the X axis. For the Y axis, we tested thousands of hours and the rails didn't work. They didn't work as good, but they were more expensive. And if you break one, it's a pain to replace. To align perfectly, it's really needing to be done in a factory, not something you could do at home. Wow, that sun. It's just, <laughs> it's just like, boom, blown out. Um, but yeah, so we did a lot of testing and the biggest difference in quality was just the material of the V-wheels. At the speeds that these print at, V-wheels are okay. Polycarbonate V-wheels are the best. POM is mm, it getting there and the, the oh, I can't remember them, the Teflon ones, they're okay. But polycarbonate, it lasts the longest. They're the easiest to repair as well. And they work. And I wouldn't have put them in if they didn't work. And that's the key thing. It lowers the price, same performance because what would you rather have? Paying 50 pound more for the same machine, but with parts you can't repair or replace if they get damaged and the same quality. Yeah, I mean, especially from that support and maintenance perspective, which I think maybe gets overlooked by some people, it's definitely useful to be able to just get parts when you need them. Maybe if it's like within warranty and stuff, I'm sure you support it, but those things can often take just a little bit longer to deal with. And if you've got an urgent project that you need now, you know you can get parts that are available pretty much anywhere, especially when you've got a lot of off-the-shelf stuff. So that's good. The other slightly bizarre thing I'm noticing that's a little bit different, a bit of an aesthetic touch maybe, is that the side panels seem to be bamboo, which is not a material I've seen in a 3D printer before. And that the materials on the other printers seem to be different as well. So can you walk me through your like side panel thing? What's going on there? So to start with, we should preface that the side panels are structural. They're not just for beauty. They do form a majority of the rigidity of the frame, and they also make the manufacturer a lot cheaper. Um, but the second thing is, we wanted a machine that can fit in your house, or your workshop, or your factory. And depending on where you put it, depends on what you need. If it's going in like the dining room, a massive black machine might not be the best thing. I know I was murdered once for just putting a 3D printer on the dining room table. Yep. So we're offering other things, but it's also really good opportunity to focus on the sustainability side. So as long as it hits the performance metrics, we can choose a lot of materials. So we've got bamboo on the mini right here. Um, it's fantastic. We know where the bamboo was grown. We know how it was cut down. We can pay them to regrow those bamboos. And that's what we do with this because sustainability is a massive part of what we do. No matter what you can say about 3D printing, we print plastic and that's a finite resource. We've got to do what we can to just stay that a little bit more environmentally friendly. Um, other things is like, say you're in a, a dark wood house. We have a very interesting Sapili side. Here's one I prepared earlier. So the interesting thing about this is it's actually MDF right in the core. And you might be thinking back to like the original days of 3D printing where it was like wood printers, they were awful. One of our things that we focused on was, is it actually awful? Where is the benefit of using wood over other things? One thing, it's easy to manufacture with. It's very sustainable because all MDF is recycled. You won't find fresh MDF anywhere because it doesn't exist. The other thing is MDF also looks bad. So we gave it a solid wood veneer. So it's got Sapili on this one and we're working to get other materials added to it. And the reason being is it's a perfect way to get 
pure recyclability, all the benefits of a good side panel, but fit it in with your workshop, house, lab, whatever you want to match your wood. And that's just part of what we want to do. It's just make it fit in your house. That sounds really good. So it's like a, an aesthetic touch to an otherwise structural piece that just gives it not only a look, but also like that recyclability element. Excellent. So, well, thank you, Jacob, for talking to me today. It's been great to like, learn about Constructed and all the machines you've got coming up. We'll show you a little bit more on B-roll of the other machines we've got here. But thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure.